Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back. It's the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is Saturday, August 10th. We have a great show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about a whole wide variety of different subjects. Our first guest is Dr. Doug McMahon, and I'd like to welcome him to the show right now. Doug, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, and it should be uh, disclosed that Doug and I, we uh, went to high school at St. Thomas Academy back in the day, and here we are, still friends, surprisingly, too. Surprisingly. Our freshman year of, of high school, we actually uh, duked it out just one time, and <laughs> we won't get into too many of the details of that, but it just it just shows you that forgiveness and, and longevity is here, so I thank you, Doug, for, for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Tony. Yeah, can you tell uh, a little bit? about what you do for a, a living and, and why you're here? Sure, I'm an allergy and asthma specialist. I work in the Twin Cities uh, dealing primarily with uh, pediatric and adult allergies and asthma. And I'm um, here as your guest to talk about some uh, hot topics in allergy and asthma. Great, well before we uh, get into that, I have to say congratulations. Uh, you were recently engaged and I heard you put on quite uh, the theatrics for your proposal. Can, can you tell a little bit more about what you did, how you did it? Sure. Um, I did uh, go a little overboard, but uh, my fiance <laughs> wanted something special. And so I uh, developed a very big plan where I made up a fake contest and, and made up a fake diamond company and said that this diamond company was going to give away an engagement ring to the top couple in Minnesota. And so I made a fake Facebook page, and I actually had to even pay people to advertise on it so it looked like it was a real page. And then I had her friend tell her about it, and her friend said, oh my gosh, there's this contest, you guys could possibly win this. And uh, so she was telling me about it, and I had to pretend like, oh yeah, it's, it's okay, because it's such a, um, I mean, it's, I set it up, but then she was like, oh, we should check this out. And so she, uh, to do it, you had to enter, you had to submit a con, you had to submit why you're the best couple. And so she wrote this essay of why we're the best couple. And then I, on like nice paper, I wrote like, you guys won basically and sent it back to her. And so she's ecstatic, that, but she didn't win exactly. She was entering to be the top, top three contestants. And the top three had to compete in a contest in uh, Minneapolis. And so the hardest part was finding friends that she'd never met, being the fake contestants. And then somebody to run the show and one of our, some of our other classmates from high school mm -hmm. were uh, the other fake contestants and um, it was really funny because she's very athletic and so some of them were athletic things and everybody else was kind of just jogging and she was just head down sprinting as fast as she could and, um, and then afterwards we basically she's like we won we won the ring and I got down on the knee and I said, you know, I set this whole thing up. And she was more surprised than, than excited, I think. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, so, uh, I couldn't pretty elaborate. So how did you get her to initially submit for the contest again? You said you put some ads out? Well, yeah, and then I made this fake, book, fake Facebook page and I said, we're a, we're a diamond company. We're going to give away this ring to the top couple. Um, so just submit, submit this essay. And so I told her friend to look at that web page. And so her friend told her and so, wow. Wow. Well, I guess there's a, a YouTube video out because our, our buddy Tom was one of the uh, cameramen for yes. uh, the event. So if you want to find it, I'm sure you could find it on, on YouTube somehow. But yeah. congratulations. And when's the, when's the big date? Uh, June 28th, next year. So a little in, less than a year and you're yeah, in, in Madison, the club. So. In Madison, Wisconsin. Nice place. Mm -hmm. Nice Probably. place. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you just first of all talk about, did you want to be a doctor back in, you know, when you were younger in high school. I don't remember you mm -hmm. talking much about becoming a doctor back then. Is that what you wanted to do? or? Yeah, well, if you remember back in football when I was probably tackling you. Or <laughs> 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 um, no, I, um, I actually had bad, very bad asthma all my life. And a couple of years I had to um, stop playing hockey. One year I actually didn't play football. I can't remember which, which year it was mm -hmm. when I was younger. And... Um, finally became under the care of a specialist, and the specialist worked with me and um, basically made me live a normal life, was able to play sports, do things, you know, that people just take for granted. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, I wanted to be uh, an asthma and allergy specialist. Mm -hmm. And so, What age was that when you received that treatment? Uh, 
Well, I start, I, when I was very young, about two years old, I started having problems, but mm -hmm. it was about 16 when I had a very severe asthma attack and didn't know if I was going to make it through it mm -hmm. is when I decided that's what I was going to do. So. so you think that's why you, you lost the fight against me? <laughs> <of the asthma? laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, I was having an asthma attack. <laughs> so you met the doctor. What did the doctor do when you were 16? What kind of treatments did they um, Well, he's actually, there's some a lot better treatments now, but back then they were using something called theophylline, which they sometimes use, but... You have to monitor very carefully, and I um, unfortunately had some bad side effects. I had two seizures from the medications, but um, eventually you just you um, was able to give me high enough doses of that, and basically steroids, oxygen, mm -hmm. and keep me. So that was terrible. that was when you, you you decided that you wanted to get into allergies. Was even back then. Yeah. And, and is allergies and asthma are they related somehow or? Yes. Very much so. I, I actually was under the care of a pediatric pulmonologist, and I still am in close contact with him, and we're actually on an asthma um, committee together now, which is kind of neat. And he, he actually advised me, said, you know, if I was going to focus on asthma, I would actually be an asthma and allergy specialist because the majority of asthmatic patients do have allergies, and so hmm. if, you are, if you help treat the allergies, you, your asthma is normally under a lot better control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of uh, kids, I think, is the prevalence of asthma uh, becoming, is it more prevalent now than it was earlier? And what are some of the causes of it? Yeah. So, unfortunately, both allergies and asthma are increasing. And um, we're not sure exactly why. One of the biggest theories is something called the hygiene hypothesis, which basically means we're almost too clean. And so, instead of our bodies... Um, basically continuously seeing dirt and microbes and things like that mm. that are um, that were prevalent in our bodies or around us that now our body sees little nu nuisance things, uh, dust mites, these pollens, and it starts firing this big response up to it and causes inflammation, cause inflammation in the nose and then also in the airways. So that's interesting. So it, part of it might be there's a lot of parents out there that are very, very protective of their kids, always washing their mm -hmm. hands and trying to protect them from all these different types of germs. So you're saying then that <laughs> maybe being exposed to yes. a little more dirt and a little more... Yeah, it looks that way. Kids that grow up on farms actually have a less likely to be allergic or asthmatic. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And are there any sort of telltale signs that parents, you know, you said that you were, you were diagnosed when you were around two years old. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it that your parents saw at mm -hmm. that time? Or was it your yeah. parents that observed yeah. it or somebody else? Yeah, there's um, recurrent wheezing, which is kind of like a whistling sound when, when kids breathe. When they get colds, if they have recurrent wheezing, that doesn't necessarily mean asthmatic, but there's something called the asthma predictive index, which we can stratify in which patients are more likely to develop asthma or have it. And it has to deal with family history, if you have a strong family history, if you have sensitization to um, um, al allergic environmental things and a certain blood test, then you're more likely to develop asthma. And so it's kind of a, a nice way we can stratify it. But other signs of recurrent cough um, for asthma, and then struggling to breathe, which isn't the easiest to find with kids, but a couple things you can look for is actually like nasal flaring, meaning their nostrils kind of flare when they breathe a lot. Um, they use accessory muscles, so they'll kind of sit in this tripod position a lot more. Instead of talking in a full sentence, they'll start to talk and then have to stop, take a breath, and then continue their sentence. Mm. Those are some things that you can identify in children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I remember growing up, like a lot of the younger kids use the inhaler. Um, mm -hmm. Is that still kind of the most common method of treating or, or dealing with asthma? Yes, there's a couple different types of inhalers. Um, that The one that you see people use just when they're exercising that, it's called a bronchodilator. That relaxes the muscles around the airways and it works very quickly. It works, lasts for about four hours. So that's a nice medicine that people that have intermittent asthma. But people who have more severe asthma or persistent asthma need to be on a controller therapy, and so that, those are often inhaled steroids or a combination of inhaled steroid and a long-acting bronchodilator, so. Mm -hmm. And do people, you know, it seems like kids are, are more affected by it, maybe I'm wrong by that, uh, but over time, is there healing that takes place, yes. improvement? Yes, um, myself is a good example. I mean, I was in the hospital probably 30 days a year, my first couple years of life, and I've been in the hospital in years now, 
and they're looking into it. It seems to be around puberty is that a lot of kids actually get better. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be almost a bimodal pattern where towards later in life some people start to redevelop those um, symptoms. So mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little more about uh, the allergy part? Because we're in allergy season, and do, mm -hmm. when exactly does it begin for most so, people? So people can have year-round allergies. Those are often to dust mites, which is a common environmental allergen. And people can have it to molds, which can be indoors, and then um, cat and dog dander. Mm -hmm. Those are common year-round ones. But um, the ones, the allergies that a lot of people commonly think about are tree pollen, grass pollen, and weed pollen. And it's actually the pollens that cause problems. So in the uh, spring, trees pollinate. And that's where people have problems then. And then in the summer, grass pollinates. And right now is, rag, is the weeds. And ragweed is a common weed in uh, Minnesota that people have problems to. And people say hay fever. And the term came from people cut hay in the fall. And they always thought, you know, it's this hay that's getting aerosolized that's causing me problems. But it's actually the weeds that are in the environment at that time that causes the problems for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember from back in the, the football days, you know, right around August, we'd be rolling around in the grass and there'd be freshly cut grass yeah. and it used to bother that my eyes would get all red and sneezing and yeah. kind of some, some feelings in the, in the back of the throat and whatnot. Yeah. But you're saying so it was actually wasn't caused by the grass, it was caused by... Prob the, probably the weeds actually at that time. So. Hmm. Wow. So Why were you rolling around the grass at football practice? <laughs> <laughs> Let's tackle football. It, it, that's why people tackling and, and getting hit and everything like that. But we had, uh, you know, I posted on Facebook that uh, you were going to be on the show today uh, mm -hmm. discussing allergies and whatnot. And uh, Barbara, who's a, a fan of the show, she asked me to ask you if there's an association uh, to weight gain and allergies and antihistamines. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so some of the antihistamines, uh, particularly the first generation, first generation means basically um, the ones that, like Benadryl, and those actually increase people's appetite. And so t sometimes with, when little kids, if we had tr trouble getting them to gain weight, we'd actually give them some uh, first generation antihistamines to actually increase their appetite. The second generation ones are the ones you hear a lot on the advertisements now, Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra. Those ones don't um, really do that very much. And so, but they can, if they're taken in a higher dose than the regular, they can cause people to be tired. And then if you're tired, you're not gonna be active and technically could make you gain a little bit more weight just because of your lethargic. Mm -hmm. And are there any other uh, like alternative treatments you know, for people that maybe don't necessarily like to take medicines, prescription med medication. Is there anything on the natural side mm -hmm. uh, to treat allergies? Yes, um, one thing that I actually like a lot is um, what's the neti pot or a, a sinus rinse. It's basically salt water, um, use fresh water, uh, excuse me, use clean water is what I should say. Um, so you boiled or um, some other clean source. And it has a salt salt packet. It's not just table salt. It's a certain salt that's um, pH balanced, so it doesn't irritate the nose. And it basically flushes the, the sinuses, and so it irrigates it and removes any allergens and mucus in the nose. And people mm -hmm. can use those on a regular basis. So how do you, what do you mean, how do you actually take it then? So it's actually, um, the one that I use is actually called a Neal Med sinus rinse. Um, you can get them CVS, anywhere like that. Um, it looks like a little squirt bottle, and you put the, water in and then literally just squirt it up your nose and so you'll be either over a sink or else in the shower and some people don't like it because it almost feels like you're jumping into a pool with mm -hmm. your nose open but mm -hmm. um, you if you do it on uh, you can do it and you kind of get re used to it and some people just love it and because one it's no medicine and, and two it's cheap and uh, it doesn't have really any side effects. So, mm -hmm. so you, just, you just literally stick a tube up there and, and force the water right through? Yep. Yeah, it's not even a tube. It's just yeah, just a little, looks like almost like a baby bottle nipple at the end of it and just squirt it up there. Mm -hmm. But um, I've heard of people doing that, like if they have the, the starting symptoms of a sinus mm -hmm. infection, before yep. it gets too bad, they'll actually do yep. that and they swear by it. Yeah, a lot of people do. And then so it works too for allergies or sometimes people even do it on a regular basis and they notice better symptoms. So. Mm -hmm. 
And can you talk a little more about uh, the clinic that you're working at, where it is, and do you need insurance in order to get consultation from you, and, and how mm -hmm. that works on, on that side? Yeah, I work at um, Midwest Allergy and Asthma. It's a division of Midwest Ear, Nose, and Throat. And we have clinics in Burnsville, um, Maplewood, Egan, Woodbury, and downtown St. Paul. So a lot of clinics, and we, um, we take all, every, all insurances. You do not need a referral from your primary physician. You mm -hmm. can just come stop in, and um, we have uh, weekend hours too, some Saturdays in case you're working, because another thing that we do is, um, it's called allergy immunotherapy, or people come and think of allergy shots. Basically what it is is we take, we test you for what you're allergic to, and then we mix up a serum basically of everything you're allergic to and dilute it down mm -hmm. and inject it into you. And then we, you come back a week later, we give you a little bit higher dose, a little bit higher dose, and basically your body becomes immune to these things. Mm. And so it's actually very efficacious and um, a lot of people like it because then again, it's not a medicine and um, basically it's your body becomes used to it. And so then eventually you don't need these shots and you don't have the symptoms even off it, so. Mm. Yeah, I've noticed that I used to be really allergic to cats and I don't know if it's the same mm -hmm. thing but you know if I'm exposed to a cat right away I'll just my whole body will react terribly to it and then uh, we actually had some cats for a while at the Hernandez household in St. Paul because we had a mouse problem for a while so <laughs> we actually had to, ha had to have those cats and I noticed that the symptoms would disappear over mm -hmm. time is that kind of the same yeah, thing in behind essence, it? Yes yeah I don't recommend somebody getting a cat to do that <laughs> but um, yes some um, people can become tolerant and actually had a patient the other day that had the problem where he grew up with dogs and cats and then he went to college and now when he comes back to visit over the holidays he has symptoms at his parents house where he never did before hmm. so well Doug uh, you gotta you're gonna be going on to uh, pitch the the first pitch at the St. Paul Saints game tonight so I, uh, I don't want to take up uh, too much of your time but I certainly Appreciate you being here. It's good to see you again. And yeah, uh, again, congratulations on, on the engagement. And All right, thanks uh, a lot. Best of wishes uh, with the wedding planning and everything like that. So, All right, well, thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. McMahon. So that is Dr. Uh, Doug McMahon, uh, who stopped by to talk about allergies and his clinic and uh, everything of the sort. And certainly appreciate the great information that, that he was sharing about asthma and everything like that. And hopefully you guys got some good information uh, because, as he said, it's becoming more and more prevalent. But it looks like that the treatments out there are uh, becoming stronger and uh, becoming more effective of the sort. So. Uh, we like to uh, have our guests and just some, from a diverse viewpoints and everything. And we're going to be bringing on uh, Nancy Fulmick next. And she's going to be talking about weight gain, weight loss, uh, the various treatments uh, or methods to lose weight, which I've been trying to do here over the last uh, five or six weeks. I don't know how successful I've been, but I definitely feel better. And uh, my clothes are fit fitting a little better. And I'm eating less of those carbohydrates and other foods that really add inches to your waistline and kind of make you feel sluggish and everything like that. But before we bring her on, we're going to uh, play a, a clip from WCCO. And uh, this is uh, State Senator Julianne Ortman. She recently announced her candidacy to run for the United States Senate. Uh, she's seeking the Republican endorsement. Uh, she wants to defeat uh, Senator Al Franken. Uh, there's uh, two other people in the race right now, two other Minnesotans. It's Representative Jim Abler and then Mike McFadden. Uh, he is also running, so there's three people in total right now. Uh, but we're going to uh, line up this clip now, if Dallas could put it on the screen, and uh, we'll play it. Well, in news this morning, Another Republican wants to challenge Senator Al Franken in his re-election bid. Senator Julianne Ortman entered the race yesterday. She is the state senator that represents Carver County in the Minnesota State Senate. Ortman made her official announcement yesterday in Waconia. We don't need any more yes men in Washington. We don't need any more disinterested millionaires in the Senate. We already have over 60. We don't need any more celebrities who think it's their job to sit back and watch and provide comedic commentary. We need a strong, independent-minded woman. 
Ortman is an attorney and small business owner. She and her husband have four children. Other Republicans running for the Senate against Franken include Mike McFadden, a Sunfish Lake businessman, and Representative Jim Abler, an eight-term state representative from Anoka. The Republican primary is scheduled for August 12th, 2014. And State Senator Julianne Ortman joins us now. Thank you so much for coming in. Good morning. How fun to be here. All right. Let me ask you, uh, why is it that you feel you want to run against Al Franken? Yeah, thank you. You know, when I was a little girl, my father taught me to have the courage of my convictions. And so I believe that we can do better. I, something is very wrong in Washington. And we can't wait six more years to get to the heart of the problem. We have a U.S. senator that has ducked the most important issues facing our nation. And so I believe it's important to step up and run. We need more Minnesota and Washington and less Washington and Minnesota. All right. Uh, what, what issues has Senator Duck specifically? Well, in particular, we have a $17 trillion national debt and no plan to pay for it. We have, a, coming out of an economic recession, a part-time economy. We need more jobs in Minnesota, and government has gotten in the way of business investment and job growth. And when government is in the way, it has to reform itself, and we need to reform our, our government in Washington. All right. You, of course, are not running alone or, or seeking the Republican nomination for that part. Let me ask you, will you abide by the nominating process, or will, if you do not get the nomination, will you go to a primary? Well, I'll tell you that I am a Republican, and I'm not planning to run against Republicans. I'm planning to run against Al Franken. And so every effort between now and November 4th, 2014, will be to put, put together the strongest race I can against Al Franken. But the person who has to run against Al Franken either has to get the nomination, has to be the winner of the primary. Right. If you don't get the nomination, will you proceed to the primary? Well, it will be important, but I intend to run and win in the endorsement. So you plan to get the nomination if you don't get it? I intend to run and win in the endorsement. So that means if you do get it, you will not what go to the primary? It, what it means is I don't have any plan to run against Republicans. I think we need to be a good, strong team in the next election. We need to work together to make sure as a unified party, we bring the best case possible to the voters of Minnesota and win in 2014. Okay, because a lot of people want to hear that answer because you've got one opponent, uh, Mike McFadden, a wealthy businessman, uh, who has indicated that he may well go to the primary if he doesn't get the nominating process. He is not a well-known individual, but this right. week he picked up two very big endorsements from former Republican U.S. Senators Norm right. Coleman and Rod Grams. Right. They're saying they think he is the best man or best person to run against Al Franken. How would you respond to those endorsements? Well, I respect them both, and I'm grateful for their service to our state, for their service in the past. But it's time to move forward. We have an election that's 14 months away, and we need to go out and get every voter we possibly can to hear our Republican principles. All right. In so that's uh, State Senator Julianne Ortman and uh, getting grilled right there by Esme Murphy of WCCO about whether or not she is going to abide by the Republican endorsement or, you know, if she didn't get it, whether or not she's going to keep uh, going forward in the primary. She very confidently asserted that she's going to win the endorsement and that's what she's running for and she's not running against uh, her Republican uh, colleagues, but rather she is running uh, to win and to win against Al Franken. So uh, that was just an interesting exchange uh, back and forth that I wanted to play for everybody uh, before we bring on our next guest. And uh, we're going to do that right now. So I'd like to uh, reintroduce to you uh, Ms. Nancy Fulmick. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Tony. Good to see you again. Yes, awesome. You look better. Uh, Last time I saw you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've been, you know, I've been, you can talk to Leona, she'll vouch for me. I've been working really hard to uh, moderate what I eat and to mm -hmm. stay away from those carbs mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the shake, uh, mm -hmm. the shakes that you've been uh, suggesting to me. Um, you know, I've kind of gotten used to this and I've been eating less and I don't know if I've been losing weight or not. I haven't been, as you've told me I should be doing and I really should. I haven't been You're me very measuring busy. That's... my waist or... I haven't been st stepping on the scale every day, but I, I will say this, that I can attest that I feel better. Mm -hmm. And when I put on my pants or put on a, a shirt, it, it just fits a little better. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually surprised because, you know, I like, I eat a lot. I have a, a, a metabolism that requires me to, to eat quite a bit. And uh, I, w I didn't think that I would be able to just have two shakes a day in a meal. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I thought that I would be too hungry I thought that I wouldn't be able to handle it. I thought that I'd feel uncomfortable. I thought that, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised by uh, how I, I haven't felt hungry. Right. 
Is there like something in those shakes that make you feel that way or is yes. it just? Yes, it's everything your body needs compacted into 200 calories. So it makes it easier to lose weight because you have the less calories, but you're feeding your body everything that it needs. So that's hmm. why you feel like a million bucks, so. That's interesting. Yep. I mean, I've been taking the, the vitamins and mm -hmm. taking the, what, what is the cell? Yep, yep. Uh, What is it called? Cell activator. And what does that do again? Um, it actually is helps with your digestive system, so it helps the, the villi regrow so your body can actually absorb nutrition. So that's kind of an important part, so. Mm -hmm. And then I've been drinking the uh, the, the special tea as mm -hmm. well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, you just put a little bit in there and you add some hot water and, mm -hmm. And apparently, it, you said it burns calories as it you're says, drinking uh, uh, yep. drinking tea. How does that work? It's uh, got a thermogenic effect, which means it increases your metabolism to actually burn calories. And they say it burns 80 to 100 calories per serving, approximately. So it depends on the person, but it just you know it's got the green tea and black tea in there, and that's what that's known to do. So hmm. yeah, be I mean, careful. Not all green teas are made equal. Just what do you mean by that? Um, we were just looking at the store the other day, somebody brought into our weight loss challenge, it says green tea. And you looked at the back of the ingredients, the first ingredient was corn syrup, then it was a bunch of other ingredients, and the very last thing on the oven, this long, long label actually said green tea, but the, long before green tea was food coloring to make mm. it look like tea. Mm. <laughs> nice. So be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that I've grade myself as an A plus by no means in terms of, you know, stick with my diet and trying to, to lose weight. I, I definitely feel like there are some extra things that I can do. I mm -hmm. feel like I can be a little more disciplined. I feel like I can be a little more focused. Uh, but I have to say it's tough. Like, you know, my schedule, I usually you don't get, get home schedule. till nine, 10 o'clock at night. By that time, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still find time to work out, mm -hmm. you know, in between here and there. Uh, but I feel like there's still like something missing and I, I can't quite put my finger on exactly yep. what it is, but maybe what it is is, you know, not monitoring the results. You know, it's like if you're trying to achieve a goal. Right. And can you describe a little more why that's important? Um, say that again. Well, or I mean, just, just my, you know, like being able to see the actual right. weight loss right. and measure the right. pounds or the Well, the here's, inches. A, here's a great example. So one of the reasons why we talk about taking your weight measurements, you know, every Monday, Friday, is because uh, there was one month that I actually lost zero pounds, but I lost 23 inches. So if I would just step on the scale, that could seem like, oh, it's not working. You know, you get very frustrated. You get frustrated, what do you do? You eat. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. or, um, <laughs> have a beer. Or have a beer, whatever it is. Um, but if you actually take your inches, you're like, oh, sweet, another five more inches, another five, you know, wherever. Because sometimes it's, you know, a quarter inch everywhere around. What may not you might not notice it in your pants, but you might, you know, they start to accumulate, and that's that's kind of a nice. Um, you get focused. You get more enthusiastic about the two when you see the results that way too. And actually, we just started a seven day challenge. Um, a group of us. They're all coaches and. Um, from one day to the next, we just we talked about hitting your protein number, which we talked about you know, with, with you too, um, and stay in our calorie range. And we did that all for seven days, and we, had, we hit exactly that number every single day for seven days. And I lost 2.4% body fat in seven days. Wow. But the scale has stayed the same. Was that the So I'm like, that's sweet. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> was that the contest that you actually, that's the one that you won? Or? No, that was a different contest. Because I saw something on Facebook yep. that you posted yes, that, that you awesome. actually won some cash so money. It was a nationwide contest. Okay. Um, a bunch of us all got together and we did, <laughs> we had a couple different categories. We had number of inches lost, the body fat percentage loss, the number of weight, the best weight loss, and then we had the category for best before and after picture for athletes, for those that wanted to gain weight, and then the weight loss people. So I found a pair of really old shorts that I haven't worn since junior high when I was underweight, okay? I could not even button them. I mean, they were like, I could barely get them on. Mm -hmm. I thought this is perfect. If I can fit into these at the end of 10 weeks, that's awesome. So at the end of 10 weeks, I buttoned them on, took the picture, and I actually won the best before and after photo. So wow. that was pretty cool. So. Yeah, and you won like a nice little prize nice for little that too. Nice little cash for that too, so yeah. total bonus. Money talks, as yeah. they say. As they say, yes. But uh, yeah, that's cool. So I need your advice though. Last, yep. Okay, so last night, and maybe you run into this when you work with uh, your, your people, um, food is a very social aspect yes. of life, you yes. know? 
you can't especially it. you're invited to somebody's house mm -hmm. and they have a, a meal that they prepared and, and I imagine vegetarians run into this quite a bit mm -hmm. and you know you don't want to be rude in right. terms of you made this and, and to say no and I have a, a particular you know I, I don't like saying no to people right. uh, too often I don't like them to think that I'm like stuck up or snobby or, right. or whatever it might be so we had this meal last night it was delicious delicious kebabs beef kebabs, chicken kebabs, the, the vegetables, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then they had the rice, and then they had the, the tortillas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, it, when they passed it around to me, uh, you know, I didn't take any of the rice, and I didn't take any of the tortillas, and it wasn't because I didn't want to. They looked absolutely you, scrumptious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looked like the perfect, but I was like, you know, no, it, especially because it was later at night, and, mm -hmm, you know, I'm mm -hmm. trying to do this weight loss thing. And yep. so... Do you have advice for people, or, or do you think, generally speaking, people kind of understand? Oh, well, first of all... Because I don't want to announce to everybody that I'm on a diet either. I will on the show, right, of right, course, but right. outside of the show, I don't tell people because, right. I don't nobody, know, is it their Nobody business? wants to say that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, why do I need to announce to the world that I'm doing something? Mm -hmm. You know, that sometimes they say in goal setting, too, is not to tell anybody so then nobody sabotages you, whether, whether, whatever your goal might be whether it's to buy a new car or a house or whatever, if you start saying, I want to do it, people, somebody's always going to come back and attack you. So sometimes mm -hmm. they say not to share your goals. But anyways, um, that's a very common, common question that people ask me all the time. And in our weight loss challenge, we devote a whole hour just to how to address that issue. So um, I'll give you a few tips of that, but definitely cover a lot of that. Um, but one of the things I always like to let people know is you're not the only one who wants to be healthier and eat better. So if you're going to a party at a friend's house, you know, sometimes it's potluck, you know, make sure you bring food that you can eat, you know, mm -hmm. so you have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. Also, too, if you're eating out, um, we always tell people, you know, eat your protein first, so you're full, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, your complex carbs, your vegetables and whatnot, and you're going to find that you're not hungry for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And that way it's easier to, you know, you still have it on the plate, whatever, you're not um, actually you're full, so you don't, you, if you said to somebody, like, how come you're not eating anymore? You're like, oh, I'm so full. No one's going to say anything, mm -hmm. right? But if you, you know, if you Unless say, I'm on a... grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like it. <laughs> you don't love me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of way to do it. Just hit, you know, stay to protein first, because then you actually really will get full, so that you're not, you're not even tempted with that. You too. just said something, though, that I think is kind of alarming. You, you said that vegetables are bad for you? No. Eat that. We say eat that second. I mean... You have your, veg your, your protein first, because that's going to fill you up, and then eat as much vegetables as you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no limit, but stay. That, it's easier to stay away from, you know, the carbs and whatnot, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have food allergies, and they don't have issues going somewhere and saying, you know, I can't eat this or that. So, you know, you can always make it up. Oh, I'm allergic to carbs. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. <laughs> food allergies. Can you describe Sugar. what kind of food allergies you're talking about? Well, sometimes people have, you know, whatever, they're allergic to dairy, for example. You know, you're not going to force somebody, make them feel guilty about not eating milk or something. Mm. So, same thing. So, people usually are very sensitive when you do it. And so, it's not that. It's less, be le most people don't realize how many other people are like, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I've been struggling with that too. And then you kind of find a common ground on that too. Mm. And what about... I know, uh, maybe guys don't because girls were like, oh, yeah, finally. Mm. <laughs> Just a group of us. <laughs> so do you think uh, you're ever going to come out with a, like a protein beer product? Is that in the works? So you no, know, that's, I'll bring that up next, next meeting. I'll say Tony wants a, I think a weight would, loss protein beer. I think that that could be a huge seller. I think it'd be awesome. I don't know how exactly you would do it. Cause actually the, the actual alcohol is not necessarily good for weight no. loss, is it? Or, or? Well, alcohol itself primarily is a, is a simple carb. Mm -hmm. It's all sugar. Mm -hmm. So it's, you drink it, and your blood sugar goes straight up and down. Mm -hmm. That's why it becomes very addictive. So a lot of times it just, your blood sugar level drops. What do you want more of? You know, wanted to go back up. Yeah, again. you want to, You feel like you need to go back up, so you have another one, and mm -hmm. that's that's. Part and that's of similar it. to like potato chips as yeah, well. Whether it's potato chips or if it's beer them, or if it's chocolate, you know, same thing. So. Hmm. So do you have anything uh, in the mix coming up here that uh, you can let everybody know about? Well, like I said, we just finished up our current weight loss challenge, which actually ends this next week. So the big money payout. So I can't wait to see who's going to win that one. 
Um, and then the new one's going to be starting the next week. So uh, we can actually the payout will be up to $1,000, which is super nice because who can't use an extra $1,000 mm -hmm. um, and look great for doing the same thing. So it's an eight-week course. Mm -hmm. um, helps people, like you said, talk about how to dine out and enjoy life with friends and still lose weight. Actually, we had a guy uh, in our last weight loss challenge, his mother was in the hospital out of state, so he just up and left town and he ate out three days a week and was still able to lose weight by what we taught. So hmm. it's, it's all possible. So. Nice. Well, I told you that I need to get uh, some more of the, the shake. Mm -hmm. You know, I've finished the full, whatever, however big that thing is, mm -hmm. of, of the strawberry and what other what other flavors are there? Because I might want something different this time. Oh yeah, there's tons. I, I like the, the berry kind. There's a, good. a new flavor out that's dolce de leche, which is my favorite. It actually, tastes like caramel ice cream. Mm. So I don't know if you're interested in ice cream, but there there's a whole bunch of different flavors. I got seven flavors to choose mm -hmm. from. I've just been mixing it with the milk. It's it's been fine for yep. me so far. So good. probably getting my uh, calcium and, and everything like that. Good. And then how are uh, people? able to get a hold of you if they, if they want help from sure. you to yep, lose weight? Absolutely. My direct number is 651-649-4646 or you can email me at uh, ubthin2 at hotmail.com. Ubthin, like Y-O-U? U-B-T-H-I-N, the number two, at hotmail.com. Ubthin2 yep. at hotmail.com. There you go. Nansa, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Good to see you again. Good and to see lots of you. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you soon. And after the show, I'll, I'll pick up another one of the, Sounds good. the shake mixes. And, and maybe I'll just keep uh, getting fitter and fitter and That's fitter right. here. So we'll see about You'll that. You'll have best before and after picture next time. Well, I took my before picture, <laughs> and it's hidden on my phone right now, and I'm not That's showing okay. anybody. That's OK. <laughs> so, but it does exist. Actually, Leona saw it because she was flipping through my phone once. And she's like, what's this? Like a picture of me with my shirt on, like or shirt off, taking a picture. But in the there's mirror. nothing better that when you reach your goal weight, to say, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. Even nobody sees it, but you saw it. Mm -hmm. You know. No doubt. Well, thanks again for you coming bet. on. Thank you. Good mm -hmm. luck. Thank you. That's uh, Nancy Fulmick, weight loss specialist. Uh, you can get a hold of her, as she said, if she can help you to lose some weight, feel better, feel fitter. I know that she's been uh, helping me. I definitely feel better in my body. Uh, than I did uh, six weeks ago when uh, I first met her. So, so far, so good. And I'll tell you, though, it's, it's not easy. It's something that you have to uh, remain committed to. It's something that you have to uh, basically just keep doing, and, and you have to keep your eye on the prize. But one thing that I really uh, in, like about the program is it's not, I don't feel like I'm, I'm like binging or purging, which I think is uh, quite often what a lot of people do with their diets. Like I actually feel like I am uh, setting a new course in terms of my caloric intake, in terms of my nutrition, and you know, really trying to balance that with uh, the hectic lifestyle that I have. Uh, you know, I work a lot, and, but I really feel like it's, it's starting to slowly but surely uh, become incorporated uh, into my lifestyle, which is something that, that I definitely appreciate because um, you know, I've gone on those binge diets before where you need to lose weight for a certain thing, and it's awful. I don't like it. It's, uh, you know, it's just you feel like you're either starving yourself or you get so hungry that you just eat, like, two or three hamburgers because you haven't eaten for 12 hours, and, and that's not how I feel at all. So, so far, uh, so good. And I wanted to uh, make an announcement. I was actually, uh, it was last week, you know, sometimes you have those days where you're just seeking some type of an inspiration. Uh, you're seeking some type of a, a, a guidance, you know. Sometimes you, you feel like, you know, it's like that question, where am I going? Where are, am I going from here? And, and so I reached out to some of my friends on Facebook and just asked people to uh, share anything that anyone is doing that's big, you know, or, or starting something. People who are asked, writing books or starting a business or a beginning of movement or, or starting a not-for-profit or, or running for office. And I was actually overwhelmed by the amount of people who uh, shared some of the things that they're doing right here in the, in the Twin Cities. And uh, one thing that I want to share in particular is a young woman. Her name is Melissa Kiefer, and uh, she is from uh, the Woodbury area. And uh, there's a big walk that's taking place. It's called uh, the Energy for Life Walkathon. 
and it's next Saturday, uh, August 17th, and it's at Normandale uh, Lake, which is on West 84th Street in Bloomington. And uh, you can see there's a picture of, of Melissa right there. Uh, but basically, she's part of, it's the Minnesota chapter of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. And it's, uh, they're basically reaching out to the community and they're raising awareness and support uh, in fighting mitochondrial disease in the area. Um, and you know, whether it's somebody you love or maybe somebody you know, or, or you just want to uh, be part of this in general, um, you know, we ask you to take part in the walk. Again, it's uh, next Saturday. It's August 17th on Normandale Lake in, in Bloomington. So, uh, but yeah, I would highly, uh, I would highly en encourage everyone to, to check it out. And actually, she had a, a nice article here in the Woodbury uh, Patch, you know, which kind of just goes over, you know, some of her, um, uh, you know, what she has in terms of the disease. It's mitochondrial, I can't pronounce this word, and cell phalomyopathy, lactosidosis. Um, but stroke-like episodes, and I guess that's the acronym is, is M-E-L-A-S. And uh, yeah, Melissa Kiefer, she's raising money for research and participating in the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation Energy for Life Walkathon on August 17th. And uh, just to read briefly, the patch asked her, what is it like to have um, Melis or Melas? And uh, she said, it's changed my life because the mitochondrial disease affects me in many ways and is different from day to day. She says it stands for mitochondrial, and again, I can't pronounce the word. I wish Doug was here, Dr. McMahon, he could. Encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis. Uh, but you have stroke-like episodes, and she admits it's a mouthful, uh, but basically it can attack any part of my body, brain, muscles, organs, etc. And physically, I have to take a lot of vitamins daily to help me have the energy. That is why we call the, the walk the energy for life. And uh, so that's pretty amazing. And it's pretty inspiring to see a young woman out there, uh, a go-getter, uh, raising awareness and, and really um, turning her situation around into something positive where she's able to impact other people. Uh, to raise awareness for this and, and to get people to talk about it because uh, she's one of many uh, people who uh, suffer from this. But again, uh, it doesn't seem like it's dragging her down. It, it in fact, makes it look like it's strengthening her and uh, giving her more courage uh, to go out there and be who, who she is. So, Melissa Kiefer, uh, we salute you here. And I think that I'll be taking part in the walk uh, next Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, as long as uh, Leona and I don't have our baby that day, which uh, certainly is a possibility because it's going to happen any day now. Uh, you know, we're due September 1st, but, uh, you know, we're at full term actually today. So any day hereafter, uh, I'm going to be a proud father and, and Leona's a proud mother. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, moving on, um, we're going to, uh, I'm just going to talk about some various stories that we're in the news recently, some recent current events, uh, things that are happening in the world. Uh, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, the first one was uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, he was actually, uh, Russia gave him temporary asylum, so he's going to be staying in Russia, I think, for at least the next year. The agreement was, was that he wasn't going to uh, release any more damaging secrets to the United States. but. Uh, the Obama administration did not take this too lightly, and uh, President Obama actually canceled uh, the meeting that he had uh, with Putin, uh, which was going to take place at the, the G20 summit, and uh, he decided to cancel it. And I wanted to play this clip because President Obama was on the Jay Leno show not too long ago, and so we're going to see his uh, response to that now. Barack Obama has cancelled a scheduled meeting with Vladimir Putin next month in protest at Moscow's decision to grant temporary asylum to former U.S. intelligence analyst Edward Snowden. But the U.S. president will go to Russia for the G20 summit in St. Petersburg. On a TV talk show, Obama criticized what he called Russia's Cold War mentality. I was disappointed mm -hmm. uh, because you know, even though we don't have an extradition treaty with them, uh, traditionally, we have tried to respect if there's a lawbreaker or an alleged lawbreaker uh, in their country. Uh, we evaluate it uh, and we try to work with them. They didn't do that. 
uh, with us. And in some ways, it's reflective of some underlying challenges that we've had with, the, with Russia lately. Right. Obama didn't mention the planned meeting with Putin on the show, but Washington has since confirmed its cancellation. Snowden faces criminal charges in the U.S., including espionage for disclosing details of secret surveillance programs. His lawyer now says his client has registered a Russian address. The whereabouts of the former spy agency contractor still aren't known since he slipped away from Moscow airport last week. So that was uh, a little broadcast there about uh, that recent incident. You know, people are talking about how the Cold War uh, may be reinvigorated by this, but I have a hard time believing that. And, you know, we'll continue to watch this story as it progresses. But, you know, I really don't think it's uh, that big of a deal uh, whatsoever uh, that Russia is granting them asylum. You know, we have the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees our citizens uh, the right from unreasonable searches uh, that includes telephone wiretapping things that are done on the internet and whatnot so i'm not quite sure that there's a uh, a huge story there uh, but something else that came out of uh, hinkley minnesota this story is a couple weeks old uh, but there was a big uh, marijuana bust up in hinkley minnesota again this was a few weeks ago uh, four million dollars uh, worth of marijuana was found in the fields and uh, we're going to take a look uh, right now at that report Marijuana growing operation is shut down in Pine County today. It took 100 law enforcement officers more than 10 hours to pull all the plants, but they say tonight they got it all. Good evening, I'm Darren Danielson. The pot was growing just east of Hinkley. The street value, about $4 million. Eyewitness News reporter Travis Dill was there. It's a lot of pot. A lot of pot. That's how Pine County Sheriff Robin Cole describes this truckload of marijuana. It's all being removed from woods about five miles east of Hinkley. The sheriff says it took thousands of plants to fill his dump truck to the brim. About uh, 5,000 to 5,500. There's no marijuana left in those woods. So they were, all, uh, they were all pulled up. He says the plants were found in patches over 40 acres of land. Although it isn't a sophisticated growing operation, he says it was being tended to. Obviously, somebody planted it. Somebody was taking care of it. But he says the plants were found by accident, and there are no suspects at this time. Still, the sheriff says confiscating this much pot is a good thing. Well, obviously, this isn't something as sheriff you want in your county. So I'm very happy that it's now been loaded into a dump truck, and we're going to get rid of it. It was, uh, it, it was rather shocking, actually. The sheriff would not say where the plants were found, because he didn't want to suggest any property owners were involved. However, he says the county will continue to investigate the growing operation with the help of federal law enforcement. For now, he's satisfied with what they accomplished. It's a good day for law enforcement. This is a lot of marijuana that isn't going to go into the street. So we're very happy with that. In Hinkley, Travis Still, Eyewitness News. And in uh, an unrelated story, the Super Americas surrounding Hinkley are reporting that they're actually ordering less donuts and other types of snack materials for those next weeks. But yeah, that was a pretty uh, interesting story that came out of there, though. And you know, a lot of people go back and forth. Like, is this 100 uh, law enforcement agencies spending all day uh, picking out the weed and, and throwing it into the dumpster? Like, Lord only knows how much money uh, that potentially cost uh, to do that and you know maybe they should be focusing on going after the uh, meth dealers and the meth labs uh, that are here in Minnesota it might be uh, more beneficial to society to our economy and, and to local crime and whatnot uh, another story that came out is there was actually a, a new planet that was discovered and it's making news because it has this magenta color it's actually a, a pink uh, colored uh, planet which they have named, uh, what is see, what did they call it? It's GJ504B, uh, uh, but I thought it was pretty interesting because they say that this planet, uh, I believe they said it is three times the size of Jupiter. And it's similar to Jupiter in terms of how it was formed and everything. So we're gonna watch a little bit just to learn a little more about uh, this planet, so. Astronomers have snapped a photo of a pink alien world that's the smallest yet exoplanet found around a star like our sun. The alien planet GJ504b is a colder and bluer world than astronomers had anticipated and it likely has a dark magenta hue, infrared data from the Subaru telescope in Hawaii revealed. If we could travel to this giant planet, 
we would see a world still glowing from the heat of its formation with a color reminiscent of a dark cherry blossom, a dull magenta, study researcher Michael McElwain, of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, said in a statement from the space agency. Our near-infrared camera reveals that its color is much more blue than other imaged planets, which may indicate that its atmosphere has fewer clouds, McElwain added. The exoplanet orbits the bright star GJ504, which is 57 light-years from Earth, slightly hotter than the Sun and faintly visible to the naked eye in the constellation Virgo. The star system is relatively young at roughly 160 million years old. For comparison, Earth's system is 4.5 billion years old. Though it is the smallest alien world caught on camera around a Sun-like star, the gas planet around GJ504 is still huge about four times the size of Jupiter. It lies nearly 44 Earth-Sun distances from its central star, far beyond the system's habitable zone, and it has an effective temperature of about 460 degrees Fahrenheit, 237 Celsius, according to the researchers' estimates. The exoplanet's features challenge the core accretion model of planet formation, they studies researchers say. Under this widely accepted theory, asteroid and comet collisions produce a core for Jupiter-like planets and when they get massive enough, their gravitational pull draws in gas from the gas-rich disk of debris that circles the young star. But this model doesn't explain the formation of planets like GJ 504b that are far away from their parent star. This is among the hardest planets to explain in a traditional planet formation framework, Study researcher Marcus Jensen, a Hubble postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University in New Jersey, said in a statement, Its discovery implies that we need to seriously consider alternative formation theories, or perhaps to reassess some of the basic assumptions in the core accretion theory. The discovery of GJ 504b was part of a larger survey, the Strategic Exploration of Exoplanets and Disks with Subaru or Seeds program, which seeks to explain how planetary systems come together by looking at star systems of many sizes and ages with images at near-infrared wavelengths. Direct imaging can help scientists measure an alien planet's luminosity, temperature, atmosphere and orbit but it's difficult to detect faint planets next to their bright parent stars. The study's leader, Masaluki Kizaira of the Tokyo Institute of Technology, said the task is like trying to take a picture of a firefly near a searchlight. Two of the Subaru telescope's tools in particular, the high-contrast instrument for the Subaru Next Generation Adaptive Optics and the infrared camera and spectrograph, help scientists tease out light from these faint exoplanet sources. It's pretty amazing, uh, amazing stuff. And, you know, when I see astronomical uh, imagery like that and when we discover planets that are, are so far away still from us, it just makes me wonder about what we're missing in terms of our universe. And uh, I believe we need to have a, a reinvigoration of uh, what President John F. Kennedy did in uh, the 60s under his uh, presidency in terms of inspiring more space travel. It seems that uh, we haven't made uh, as much progress as you would think from the early 60s. Our rockets are essentially using the same type of technology, and it really seems like we're limited in terms of our scope and in terms of our uh, discovery potential. And, uh, you know, I call on our scientists out there, the people, the rocket scientists, let's find some alternative uh, methods to get out there and explore the universe to get further. If, if we have to do something such as putting humans on Mars first. Uh, I believe that America should be leading the way in this. It'll help us to get even further and advance the technologies. Uh, instead of spending uh, all this money and all this uh, research potential that we do on, on the military industrial complex, on drone usage, on uh, spying technologies, uh, I wish that our government was investing uh, into uh, this type of activity, at least as an alternative, or, or perhaps nothing at all, and just freeing up the market and allowing the, the private sector to uh, do these types of explorations. But it seems if we are going to spend this money on a federal level, why not put it towards discovering uh, what else is out there in terms of 
the world in terms of uh, the universe and alternative life forms and other planets that are out there. Let's send rockets out there. Let's send more people out there. Uh, get it done that way. Um, but we're coming uh, almost to the end of our uh, show here, but I wanted to, to keep uh, playing. We talked a lot about the uh, Anthony Weiner scandal, who, uh, scandal. He's running for the mayor of New York City. And I came across this video just kind of randomly. It's of uh, former President Bill Clinton. And this is significant because the CNN reporter in this case uh, was questioning Bill Clinton about Anthony Weiner uh, because uh, President Clinton was actually the officiator at uh, the Weiner uh, wedding, him and Huma. Uh, so Bill Clinton was actually the, uh, you know, the, the justice of the peace or whatever it is that you call him. So we're going to watch this uh, short clip. And it just shows, again, how masterful uh, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, is at dodging the question. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch this here. I appreciate it's awkward because you have a, a personal connection to both Anthony Weiner and his wife, Huma Abdeen. In fact, you officiated at their wedding. Has this been difficult for you to watch? Well, not because it's a political campaign, because neither Hillary or I was ever involved in the political campaign. And they understood that from the beginning. There are too many people running for mayor who have been my supporters, who supported her for senator, her for president. Uh, one was one, once her campaign manager, Mr. de Blasio. But there are literally five people in that race, uh, including one of the Republican candidates, Mr. Katsimatidis, who are personal friend of ours. So we are 100 miles from that race, and everyone understands that we're not going to be involved as long as our personal friends and people to whom we feel obligations are involved. So the feelings I have are all personal, and since they are, I shouldn't talk about them. So, yeah, there he is, uh, President Clinton, former Ple President Clinton, uh, dodging the question about his involvement in the New York City a mayor's race, and he did it in a true, truly masterful way, I believe, you know, just kind of bringing up the other candidates and the friends and even throwing in that the Republican mayoral candidate is a good friend of his and, and how many personal connections he has to that race. And, and since it is personal, how he can't make it political. Uh, I, I just thought that that was uh, at least remarkable and uh, worthy of something. Uh, finally, the, uh, the last story that I wanted to just briefly mention here was uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, made some news because, uh, you know, as many know, on August 1st, uh, same-sex marriage is recognized in Minnesota, legalized, and so that has quite a few implications for uh, health insurance plans because uh, many people were able to cover their uh, significant others, uh, in particular, um, you know, if they had a same-sex couple, uh, but they could do that through registering as uh, domestic partners. Uh, there are some other ways that same-sex couples were, were able to give either state benefits or uh, other types of benefits, uh, city benefits to their significant others. Uh, but the Mayo Clinic recently came out and they gave a, a deadline or a, a deadline of uh, 2014. And the Mayo Clinic said, by 2014, uh, you have to be married to your partner in order to have them be covered under the health insurance that the Mayo Clinic offers its employees. So I thought that that was pretty uh, amazing that they did. And it, it opened up some questions, you know, because there's going to be some people that are all of a sudden not covered because of this policy change. But, you know, if you think about it, it probably makes a lot of sense that since people are able to uh, get married equally here in Minnesota, that uh, in order to have spousal benefits that you should, in fact, be married and recognized in the state of Minnesota. So, you know, I just brought that up because I think it has some uh, implications that are worth discussing. And uh, the consequence could be that some people who otherwise had their health care may actually see their health care diminished. So uh, we're coming to the end of our show here, and I thank all of you for tuning in to the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on SCC Television Studios here in White Bear Lake. Uh, we also rebroadcast on our YouTube channel, which is Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.
That was the first time I ever did a 